And I thank you, Flora. Um, you know, going last has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the disadvantage is that some of you may be brain dead by now, or, or at least totally exhausted, or, or, or perhaps everything that needs to be said has been said. Uh, on the other hand, the, the advantage of, of going last is that you can profit by the collective wisdom of uh, everything that's, that's come before. And I have to say, I've learned a lot from the, the presentations that have been uniformly uh, excellent. And uh, well, I'm not going to sum up, per se. On the other hand, uh, hopefully I will be able to uh, make reference to uh, some of these presentations. Uh, one more thing I want to do, and, and uh, on behalf of the, the speakers, uh, I want to thank the organizers of, of this conference. You've done a wonderful job, brought together a lot of uh, diverse perspectives, and I think we've all uh, profited as a result of that. Uh, so thank you very much for the job well done. to um, note one thing, and that is that um, the involvement of uh, students in, in all different phases of the conference, I think, is a, an excellent thing, and I, I commend the organizers for the way you've uh, involved uh, the students, undergraduate students, uh, in this conference. Okay, I want to start with a tale of two cities, so as to speak. Um, the first of these is Detroit, Michigan. I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, which is across the Detroit River from, uh, from Detroit. And I grew up there in the 1950s and 1960s. And, you know, while Detroit was, was never an urban paradise, on the other hand, uh, in the 50s and 60s, it was still um, a viable city. Uh, the auto industry was still booming. Um, people from Windsor um, would uh, regularly, well, because the, uh, we had an advantage in terms of the, the, the dollar, uh, the Canadians worked uh, in, in, in Detroit. Uh, we went shopping. Uh, Detroit had one of the great department stores in America, Hudson's Department Store. Hudson's was right up there, Macy's and, and Gimbal's. And Hudson's even had a parade every, uh, every Thanksgiving. Uh, and I can remember as a 14-year-old uh, going over with my friends on, on Saturday afternoons to Hudson's start. Um, in, in addition, uh, they had a, a vibrant uh, cultural life. Uh, the Detroit Symphony uh, back then under Paul Perret was one of the great uh, symphonies in America. Um, the uh, Detroit Institute of Arts is where I discovered for the first time uh, European painting and art and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, sports. You know, uh, I mean, it was the, the golden uh, age of the Detroit Tigers and, and uh, uh, the Red Wings um, and you know, the Olympia and, and uh, uh, Tiger Stadium, as they call it, and the Brick Stadium, originally called it, so right downtown. Uh, not in good areas, but, uh, but downtown. Um, they had vibrant neighborhood life. A uh, Greek town uh, was, was vibrant. Um, but as we know, uh, Detroit's story uh, uh, went downhill. And, uh, you know, by 1967, uh, Detroit was clearly in trouble. Uh, one of the big urban riots that uh, went across America uh, happened in Detroit in 1967. Uh, Windsor people stopped going to Detroit after that, and Detroit people uh, came to Windsor. Uh, now, the roots of this went back a bit, um, but you know, partially it was, uh, or in large part, it was due to what's called white flight from the central city. Uh, no city uh, in the United States witnessed this uh, middle class flight from the central city more than Detroit. Uh, and I think even uh, by that time it, it had gone up to uh, 80% or something like that. Uh, and the middle class completely bailed out of the center city and, and went to the suburbs. Uh, and they brought uh, various institutions with them. Uh, Hudson's department store downtown built uh, a satellite Hudson's in the suburbs called Northland. Uh, and then a couple of others, and then eventually uh, the downtown Hudson's uh, was demolished. Um, the Detroit Lions football team uh, moved out of uh, uh, the stadium downtown, moved out to the Silverdome in Pontiac, which was a, uh, uh, a suburb, uh, although they eventually uh, did move back. Um, and eventually uh, you know, Detroit uh, turned into a wasteland. 
um, I think one in three houses or something in, in uh, uh, Detroit, downtown Detroit, is now, uh, lots are vacant. Um, it used to be on Halloween, it was known as Devil's Night because they bring cars to houses and things like that. Uh, and the efforts made to revive it uh, didn't work. Uh, one of the most negative uh, efforts was the Renaissance Center, uh, where they took a, uh, built a huge kind of fort along, along the river. And it was supposed to be part, it was part of the, the era of the festival marketplaces and, and other things. And uh, uh, it was supposed to turn the trout around. Uh, but instead, they made every mistake in the book. Um, they cut off access to the street. You couldn't get into it. The only way you could get into the uh, Renaissance Center was to drive in, uh, which meant that uh, none of the locals ha had any access to it. It was just for a, a tourism convention uh, crap. And eventually, uh, they had to close the Renaissance Center. It was eventually bought up by one of the auto companies, and they were trying to uh, retrospectively uh, make some effort to, uh, to make it more relevant. Um, today, Detroit's reached the point where they've given up. And uh, the latest plan for Detroit is to turn part of it anyways into farmland. Uh, and uh, they're going to, I guess, establish, uh, and they're taking this seriously. This is what surprised me, is the plan being taken seriously. Uh, they're going to establish the, these uh, farms in, in downtown Detroit. Uh, these are not, um, Julie was telling me they're not backyard victory gardens, but they're, they're larger uh, kind of neighborhood farms. Um, I don't see it myself because I remember the pollution in, in Detroit. I, mean, I remember the, the kind of snow in Detroit in July. And, and it was the snow. And guess what it was? Uh, particularly the obnoxious uh, uh, pollutant from something called Zug Island, which is about as bad as it sounds. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, I'm still amazed at the fact that Detroit is just one of the great American cities uh, in the 20th century is, uh, is now designated possibly for a farmland. Uh, contrast that to the city I live in, and I'll be much quicker about this, uh, Toronto. Uh, Toronto never went through what a lot of big American cities went through. Um, there are a couple reasons for this. Uh, one of them, I think, is, is that Tro Toronto always maintained its uh, inner city uh, neighborhoods particularly uh, middle class neighborhoods. The middle class never moved. Uh, they continued to really value uh, their neighborhoods. And when in the 1960s, uh, you know, this was the era, um, they decided to build this, an expressway right through uh, uh, these neighborhoods in downtown Toronto, people rose up and they stopped it. Um, Jane Jacobs was part of it, although um, she wasn't the leader of it, but she was certainly uh, involved. Uh, so the Spadina Expressway was stopped in its tracks. Um, when, when urban redevelopment looked like it was getting out of hand, uh, again, you know, various uh, activists, uh, uh, lawyers and, and architects and social workers and, and people like that banded together and, and basically they, they ended up stopping wholesale uh, urban uh, redevelopment and, and uh, basically turning it around. Uh, and thirdly, um, transit. That we, uh, in the 1950s, the uh, subway system was built in, in Toronto. It's been expanded over the years. Uh, not perfect, but on the other hand, uh, um, you know, by most standards in, in North America, it's considered a, a large and a successful transit system. Uh, so I want, just as I start to keep the images of these two cities in mind, uh, Detroit uh, and Toronto. Okay, what I'm going to talk about today, um, right, and then I think I've seen the of policy and strategies. Um, new ways of operating cities don't appear spontaneously in the, on the political or in the political marketplace, but they have to be conceived and they have to be framed in a multitude of ways uh, and often in competing policy arenas. Uh, and this is especially the case for smart growth. Uh, Anthony Downs, well-known public policy uh, analyst, uh, pointed out a decade ago uh, that smart growth refers to many different bundles of specific policies appealing in various degrees and ways to disparate groups. Uh, anti and slow growth advocates and environmentalists, pro-growth advocates, inner city advocates, and better growth advocates. Um, which is a lot of the problem right there. How do you uh, come up with policies that satisfy all these different groups? 
Um, at the same time, smart growth proposals have been sharply contested by a formidable cast of opponents, ranging from real estate developers and home builders to rural libertarians and conservative think tanks. I'll be talking about them a little bit later. Uh, in this presentation, I want to do two things. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce a three-stage uh, social constructionist model of uh, policy framing and political marketing uh, to help us uh, first of all, understand why and how some urban environmental uh, visions and initiatives succeed and others fail. Uh, and this is a model I developed uh, in my book, uh, Environmental Sociology, and it's been used uh, many different times around the world by the academics and, and, and activists and, and a lot of different uh, contexts. Uh, and second, I'm going to apply this to the specific case of um, the smart growth movement. Uh, especially uh, in the context of environmental concern and uh, discourse. And hopefully this will contribute to the consideration of uh, promising new directions for public policies and for managing growth and protecting space. As I've argued in, in the book and elsewhere, environmental issues problems are by no means self-evident. Rather, they must be discovered, demonstrated, legitimated, promoted, and contested by uh, social agents or claims makers who uh, assume ownership of these problems. Which is one of the problems, by the way, with the uh, uh, smart growth movement um, you know, in terms of identifying who are the claims makers and who, who has ownership. Uh, this doesn't mean that these issues or problems aren't real. Uh, the term construction is often meant to mean fabrication. Uh, I mean, it can be very real in nature, um, only that they're unlikely to be publicly recognized without undergoing this, uh, this process. Um, one of the um, terms that's often used in, in sociology and political science, uh, uh, we talk about collective action frames. Uh, these are constructed sets of meanings and beliefs that guide an interpretation of reality. Um, and two authors, Mara Morrill and Owen Smith, in the uh, 2002 noted that frames don't emerge from thin air, uh, nor do they develop uh, by themselves from organic mystical processes. Rather, they require real people in interaction and conflict in order to formulate, contest, modify, and, and deploy them. Um, there are two primary tasks uh, in the social construction of environmental problems and solutions. Invention, labeling, presentation of legitimation, and uh, contestation and consensus building. Uh, so I want to go through these uh, briefly, and uh, then uh, as I'm going, I'll apply them to the smart growth movement. Uh, in addition, there are three components of a, an environmental claim, um, grounds, warrants, and conclusions. Grounds uh, are documented in the empirical basis of the claim. Warrants are the moral imperatives that justify taking action. And conclusions are the proposed solutions. Uh, these three came from, I think, uh, the field of rhetoric and communication, but have been adopted uh, in sociology and political science. Um, this process uh, usually unfolds in, in uh, linear fashion. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to play out that way. But, but usually the way it works, uh, as we'll see, is that uh, if you don't get out of stage one, uh, then the issue doesn't go anywhere. Uh, and, and you have to basically go through all three hoops, you know, go through all three problems. Uh, the most common place where these break down, of course, is in the political sphere. Um, let's start with invention and labeling. With most environmental problems, um, discovery begins with a uh, a scientific observation uh, or, or some kind of finding that raises a red flag in terms of risk. Uh, and I, I want you just to, uh, before I get into smart growth, consider the case of something called black carbon. How many of you know what black carbon is? Well, be advised, uh, you know, black carbon is the next big thing, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, the environment. And if you don't believe that, um, you know, I was looking through uh, the um, American Power Act, 
you know, this is um, this is a piece of uh, of legislation uh, that's been proposed by uh, Terry Lieberman. Um, and if you look through that, uh, the money that's being set aside to battle uh, black carbon uh, is huge. Uh, what is it? Uh, well, they used to call it soot, or at least uh, it, it's uh, a primary component of uh, of soot. Uh, you know, soot. Um, so it's been around a long time. Uh, if any of you saw uh, years ago the movie Mary Poppins, you remember Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins. Uh, you know he was um, Bert the, the cheerful chimney sweep, uh, covering of soot. Um, nobody ever thought that maybe that wasn't a good idea. Uh, but you know, um, so, and of course Mary Poppins was set, uh, I think, back in, in uh, uh, Victorian or Edwardian times. Um, so soot's been around for a long time, uh, but suddenly. Uh, we're taking soot seriously. Uh, suddenly, soot has uh, jumped, or at least black carbon has jumped to, to the top of the, uh, the policy agenda. Uh, why? Why after all these years? Uh, well, I mean, some of it uh, uh, certainly has to do with, with uh, a new scientific uh, technology that's been able to uh, uh, measure a soot and its effects. Um, but um, part of it has to do uh, with politics, too. And that is that um, soot doesn't stay up in the atmosphere very long. It stays up most uh, two weeks on the carbon dioxide. Uh, soot doesn't stay up very long. Uh, and when it falls, it um, evidently creates great harm. And, and it, uh, particularly when it falls in the Arctic, when it falls in the snow, and uh, um, of course it darkens the, the snow, uh, which means when sunlight comes, uh, it's not reflected back up by, by the snow. Or, uh, and anyways, it. it um, the other thing about it is, is uh, soot is a lot easier, or black carbon is a lot easier to remedy than carbon dioxide. You don't need all these uh, uh, expensive carbon trading schemes and all, all these things. Uh, you know, there are lots of different ways, uh, particularly uh, having to do for shutting down uh, small stoves uh, that, uh, in uh, many parts of the world, but there are other kinds of ways of doing it. And you can, s the big thing is you can see the effect fast in terms of results. Uh, so um, politicians and others uh, and scientists and that like that because they can get a positive effect uh, fast and, and uh, use it as kind of a leverage then to uh, go on to um, doing better in the, the battle against carbon, carbon dioxide. Um, there's an article recently in The Economist about uh, um, black carbon. Um, and you know, one of the things um, well, the original stage uh, of uh, you know, discovering a problem that is it's a dramatic if you can get a dramatic event that sticks in the public's mind uh, then then that's great and in the case of um, of black carbon um, there was a um, scientist uh, from the United Nations Environment Program uh, that, that took uh, one of the officials, and they went on, on a plane trip uh, up in, into the Himalayas, and uh, you know they they discovered uh, that uh, there's all this um, soot um, coming down the side of the mountain, and, and uh, so this they were able to spearhead a campaign then uh, in order to. Um, something about this. Smart growth. Can you think of a single event uh, with regards to urban sprawl and, and smart growth that, that's that uh, identifiable? Um, you know, I mean, the problem's been around uh, for a long time. Um, you know, it, it, it's certainly not, not a new problem. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, it's hard to put your finger on, on a single scientific uh, study or fact or things like that. I mean, it's something we can see the images and, and that, and, and they look horrible. We can understand on one, uh, one hand that there's a, there's a problem. Um, so where did smart growth come from as a uh, identifiable, uh, what to call it even, you know, a movement, smart growth movement, smart growth revolution, Anthony Flint once called it that. Um, well, there, Seem to be different places it came from. Um, 
you know, certainly um, there were a group of, of uh, forward-looking uh, uh, politicians uh, back in the uh, 80s and, uh, and the 90s, uh, governors largely and non-governmental advocacy groups uh, drawn from environmentalists, public interest lawyers, academics, and planners that seem to get involved in that. Um, where did the term itself come from? Uh, I thought it came from uh, uh, Glenn Denning. Uh, and, and in fact, um, you know, he claims uh, some places to have uh, uh, come up with the, the term. Um, but um, but An Anthony Flint, uh, I think it is, um, you know, documents that, that uh, it, it seemed to have come years before, a guy named Yarrow, uh, who I noticed this is still part of the uh, Flint's Institute, um, claims to have invented it. Um, some other people say, well, uh, it's actually an invention of the Urban Land Institute, the ULI, uh, which if you don't know them, are Washington-based, well, they call themselves Education Research uh, uh, institution, uh, but they're basically a lobby group for uh, land developers. Um, and uh, you know, there's a whole book published by the ULI uh, back in the 1990s on the, uh, the problem of, uh, of smart growth. Um, you know, the author, 99, a guy named uh, Porter, said um, smart growth has become a hot political debate in communities and states throughout the, uh, the U.S. Um, whether it had or not, I don't know. And one of the problems with the ULI is that they tend to uh, identify trends, uh, uh, hold all these seminars, uh, planners and, and developers and, and other people, architects uh, flock to these uh, uh, seminars and, and then bring the information back to their own communities and things take off. Uh, when I did Fantasy City, which is a study of uh, theme cities and uh, urban entertainment, um, politics, and, and that um, one of the things I did was I meticulously sat down and, and uh, analyzed uh, every tape from uh, every one of these uh, sessions of the ULI. I um, had twice a year, once in the York, once in Beverly Hills. Um, one of the, the problems with um, smart growth uh, is definitively uh, documenting that it works as a policy. Um, and, you know, that, that's not necessarily the case. Um, I'll come back to uh, a little bit later uh, in the talk. I'll, I'll come back. Uh, to some of the research that's, that's been done evaluating uh, smart growth. And I, but I can tell you that um, at, at most it, it, it's mixed and modest, uh, you know, including the, the Lincoln Institute study that just uh, came out not too long ago. We found out that uh, uh, there are only a couple of these five different measures, and, and uh, there are only two or three of them that uh, made any difference, and even that was a, a modest effect. Uh, and from Lincoln Institute, it tends to be. Uh, front and center in the smart growth movement says this, then uh, you, know, uh, you can imagine uh, what the, the situation is. Um, the second stage uh, is presentation and legitimation. And if the first stage takes place largely within, the, uh, within science and, and research, and then the second stage takes place in the media, um, the key task here is commanding attention. Uh, that means attracting and uh, maintaining uh, public support. Um, and this is something that uh, requires uh, achieving public uh, pro uh, positive profile in mass media. Um, the study done not long ago by uh, Eric Lawrence and his colleagues, um, they look specifically at uh, smart growth, but at um, the problem of securing public support for a national urban agenda. Um, and they found evidence to, to show that some types of uh, policies do better than others. Um, specifically, uh, policies that are constructed broadly, uh, i.e. The, the plight of American cities, 
uh, rather than uh, narrowly, that is the place of specific cities, uh, that are aimed towards uh, groups in the population, target groups that are possibly flee, perceived by the population. Uh, children and the elderly are good. Uh, on, on the other hand, if you uh, pitch your uh, urban policy at, at uh, drug addicts and street youth, uh, then they don't go over very well. Uh, and those that promise the delivery of a resource to a wide swath of beneficiary, beneficiaries rather than the minority. Um, you know, distressed cities isn't a very good um, target for your policies. Uh, in securing the support of the public, the smart growth movement has been both blessed and cursed. Unlike uh, those environmental problems that aren't visible to the uh, naked eye and exist primarily as patterns of uh, scientific data, um, depletion of the ozone layer is the best example of that. You know, can't look up and see the ozone layer uh, disappearing. Uh, in fact, um, there's no such thing as a hole in the ozone layer. I don't know whether you knew that. Um, there's just a, uh, a thinning of the ozone layer. They come up, with, they strategically come up with the idea of hole in the ozone layer because they thought people could visualize that better. Um, and they're right. I mean, there's this children's performer named Bill Schatz, I think it was, that wrote a popular song called Hole, hole in the Ozone. Um, but, but anyway, um, so with those type of problems, um, you know, we depend on experts to tell us that, that the problem uh, exists. Um, but with the, the smart growth movement, uh, it doesn't take a, uh, a scientist that uh, uh, at some um, oceanographic uh, or, or meteorological institute or whatever to, to tell us that's his problem. Uh, just head out to work in the morning in, uh, in Atlanta and you get caught in, uh, uh, in the gridlock. In Atlanta, the gridlock has skipped, I think, uh, four different counties or something now. Um, you know, I mean, there, there are ways like that. So, you know, on, on one hand, that's an advantage uh, in that you can relate to people, relate to people's experience easily. Um, but on the other hand, it's also open to um, interpretation uh, on uh, people's, in terms of people's perception. I mean, um, you know, when it comes down to it, people can say, well, yeah, it's there, but it's tolerable, uh, it's an urban nuisance, it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's like noisy neighbors and raccoons. You know, uh, a nuisance, but tolerable. Um, Anthony Flint, again, um, observed that smart growth advocates have been both quite successful and poorly understood by the media. And he, uh, his book, he quote some fascinating uh, figures. Uh, from 106 news stories about smart growth in 1996, the number grew to just under 6,000 in uh, 2005. Uh, and a Google search for the term smart growth triggers 13 million hits. 13 million. Uh, as, as Flint points out, that's 3 million more hits than you get if you type in pornography. So. You know, uh, there's some kind of awareness out there, that's for sure. Um, but on the other hand, the smart growth message has not been clearly understood or conveyed by the media. Um, and as Flint points out, even the, the new urbanists with their campaign to build great neighborhoods have been had a message that's clearer uh, to the public than that of uh, smart growth. Um, in one of the things that we use in the constructionist analysis is something called, uh, as I said, frames. And, uh, although there, there may be more than this, but um, for simplification, uh, there are four basic um, smart growth frames. Um, the first of these, and I won't spend a long time on it, is the so-called uh, urban improvement frame. Uh, advocates here argue that implementing smart growth measures would encourage pedestrian-friendly communities, mixed land uses, town centers, light rail, uh, mass transit, urban parkways, and other amenities. Um, and it's, it's a lot of urban planning and design and, and that have been about for the last uh, uh, three or four decades. Uh, and, and, you know, in various ways, the, the, the other kinds of competing frames that, that have um, you know, uh, been associated with this, although they're not subsumed by it. 
um, festival marketplaces, uh, um, Richard, Florida, and the Creative City. Uh, I'm absolutely astounded. And if I take one thing away from this conference, it's that nobody mentioned the name Richard, Florida. Uh, any other urban conference I've been to in the last five years, all they talk about is, uh, is Florida and this uh, creative growth frame. Um, this uh, environmental frame. Uh, for the most part, this is included with standard uh, potpourri of uh, uh, green concerns, reducing air uh, pollution, improving soil and water contamination, preserving open space, uh, farmland, wetlands, ecologically sensitive areas, and all that type of thing. Um, recent variation on this, uh, you know, is uh, what we heard earlier about the urban agriculture and, and the food system. Um, but the one that's really on the rise in terms of the frame is uh, the third one, environmental justice. Uh, there was going to be a speaker here today, I don't know what happened. Uh, somebody was going to speak about that, uh, but didn't. Um, this pivots on the argument that communities of color uh, differentially experience negative environmental impacts and therefore stand to reap particular benefits of smart growth uh, policies. Um, and to the extent that environmental justice is a particular concern uh, uh, in areas where uh, industrial pollution, uh, developments cause pollution, um, smart growth is seen as, uh, as relevant. Um, and also because minority and low income communities uh, experience more health problems than other populations in smart growth policies uh, that involve enhancing public transit or retrofitting existing affordable housing uh, are seen as, as helpful. Um, and the fourth frame which overlaps here somewhat is uh, public health. Um, you know, to a certain extent, uh, this plugs into the, the environmental frame, uh, but there are other aspects of, uh, of public health <coughs> as well, uh, and I think we're, we're seeing this, and also uh, seems to be on the rise. Uh, what Barbara Brown talked about this morning is the, the obesity uh, frame, you know, which is uh, rising, uh, uh, flushing up funding, everything like that, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, coronary artery, uh, um, the final stage um, is I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, the final stage here is consensus building and contestation. And uh, you know, as I said earlier on, um, this has been contested and is actively contested by a, a lot of different people. Um, you know, one uh, study that, that was done uh, in 2005 looked at the, the debate over smart growth in three states, um, Missouri, Kentucky, and New Jersey, uh, and looked particularly at the frames that opponents used. Uh, in Missouri, where state level, state level smart growth legislation was slowly emerged, the grounds for uh, uh, declaring small, small sprawl a problem were challenged by opponents such as the Home uh, Builders Association of Greater St. Louis, and they used uh, language like freedom of choice, the free market, local control of land use, uh, naming of uh, urban dwellers as a real problem, etc. In Kentucky, uh, opponents uh, drew upon uh, libertarian ideologies surrounding uh, land use, particularly those that, that, that skew regulation, zoning, planning. Um, and, you know, these aren't people who just occasionally write a letter to the papers. I mean, you know, these are groups that are actively uh, uh, out there, uh, you know, particularly the, the right wing uh, uh, libertarian uh, uh, groups are out there actively uh, blogging, twittering. Uh, uh, everything else to, to oppose it. And most recently, and this, this really blew me away, uh, if you look uh, on the internet, um, smart growth is being blamed for the financial meltdown. Now, figure that one out, right? Uh, uh, and uh, you know, it's this guy named Wendell Cox. You might know that name. He's a well-known conservative op-ed uh, commentator, uh, editor of the website Demographia. Uh, he wrote a piece called Root Causes of the Financial Crisis of Primer. And this thing is being regenerated and printed in that uh, across a wide uh, uh, number of websites and institutions, so the Heritage Foundation uh, being one of the better known ones. Uh, so, uh, and in the long run, and, and I can kind of talk about this a lot, but uh, clearly, uh, if, if you look at why the problem of smart growth emerged, and we had little uh, 
snippets of this today. And, and uh, clearly, there, there were powerful uh, uh, elements in, in, in American society, not just the uh, General Motors, but also the, the energy companies. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, starting back in the 1930s and that, um, or earlier, and, and continuing on, right on through the present, there been powerful, there's been a powerful lobby uh, in favor of uh, sprawl and against smart growth. Okay, I'm now going to uh, end this, so don't get worried. Uh, <laughs> environmental problems and issues typically stall in the third stage, that is securing political recognition and support. Um, claims that are legitimated in the media bog down in the corridors of government, uh, where moral imperatives are, are uh, less important than earmarks. Um, unusually, urban sprawl smart growth entered the vocabulary of regional and state politics early in its life. Um, enjoying some legislative uh, successes before falling back in, in recent years. In fact, it could said to have entered the political arena prematurely before it had a firm moral foundation, or a firm foundation of uh, grounds and warrants. I think that's the real problem with it, is that uh, it lacks a, a moral center to it. It's a collection of policies, uh, but, uh, but it has no firm, uh, persuasive moral center or argument. Um, but, now, what's happening now is that the environmental justice movement is entering into the scene. And uh, uh, they do have a, uh, a firm uh, sense of, of uh, outrage. And... Oops. Oops. <laughs> oh, no. This is giving me a message. Um, and, you know, recently, I mean, there are a number of things that, that are, are happening where uh, there's a connection happening to environmental justice and, uh, and smart growth. Um, one commentator said, uh, the most promising policy space for smart growth initiatives is the nexus of public health, the environmental movement, and community development. And uh, there's all kinds of things happening. Uh, within the Obama administration, um, you know, sustainable communities initiative, we heard about that in the previous talk, uh, the partnership between HUD, uh, DOT, and EPA, um, there's a new focus on environmental justice in the EPA uh, smart growth program. Um, in the 2010 New Partners for Social Growth uh, Conference, uh, environmental justice uh, after complaints, and that was given a, a, a really important role in terms of that. Um, so, the question is, can a renewed emphasis on smart growth really help the environmental justice uh, community and, and vice versa? And the answer is, well, maybe. Um, Robert Ballard, one of the founders of the uh, uh, environmental justice movement, um, doesn't think so. I mean, he says, uh, he cites the uh, devastating impact of uh, urban renewal programs in the past uh, that promised to revitalize urban centers but ended up displacing black owned businesses and, and homes. Um, but at the same time, uh, it may well be that, that um, as I said, the environmental justice movement may, may be able to take over the uh, smart growth movement. And if we meet here two years, three years from now, whatever, um, that may have happened. Ballard has indicated as much, and it's a, a, made like a saint within the environmental justice movement. Uh, he says that a smart growth e uh, equity initiative should be driven, led, and facilitated by people of color in the environmental justice movement, where equity and justice form the core. Um, now, at, at this point, um, uh, yeah, I'm not suggesting this is inevitable. Last paragraph. Uh, I'm not suggesting this is inevitable or that embracing environmental justice discourse is undeniably the optimal scenario for the future. Um, big, smart growth appeal has always been its big tent um, philosophy. Uh, and this is something that, that would obviously suffer uh, in a, uh, uh, if it moved in more, uh, towards a more critical uh, perspective. Um, nonetheless, you know, as the cities and states teeter on the edge of bankruptcy, burdened by massive pension liabilities and glut of devalued housing, maybe unrealistic to uh, expect uh, that a number of these conventional smart growth initiatives ultimately are going to go anywhere. And if that happens, an environmental justice movement, uh, which has the inner track, uh, emerges and puts forward a strong argument, uh, saying, uh, as they did within the American environmental movement. Uh, once upon a time, the American environmental movement was uh, largely middle class and was uh, interested in polar bears. Um, now the environmental justice movement uh, has a significant and important role in uh, 
the American environmental movement. If it does the same thing to the smart growth movement, the smart growth movement is, is uh, a largely uh, um, scattered, uh, concentrated in, in uh, a number of different places. Um, if, if their strategy is, and I hate to quote W, uh, George Bush, but uh, you know, if, if they count on, on something happening with was it a thousand points of light or whatever, uh, hoping that they're all going to come together and produce uh, change. Um, the environmental movement will come down the, the middle. Uh, they'll grab the moral ground. And, and uh, you know, if that happens, I predict that they're going to take over the uh, smart growth movement. Amen. <laughs>